Hello, everybody. Welcome to this master class. Uh, I'm really hoping that, that we're going to have a good time uh, sharing a conversation today. My name is Leon Harris. I'm a news anchor at NBC4 in Washington, D.C. <sighs> My story is the flukiest story. I didn't, didn't even think I was going to go to college. Um, but I had a, a two, two teachers in particular in high school who just kept picking with me and making me do things I didn't want to do. Uh, they made me read books I didn't want to read, but maybe joined. I was the only guy in the, uh, in the band and also on the field playing. Um, uh, and they messed me up so badly that I ended up winning a National Merit Scholarship. And for the first time, uh, had thought about going to, to college. And uh, I went to go visit my sister at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And they had seven radio stations on campus and two newspapers. And I thought that was so cool. And so I enrolled there, and I was studying management. I was a radio television management major. Uh, and then one day, a guy named Ted Turner came to speak, and uh, he had just started this thing called CNN. And I went to go listen to him and uh, talked to a couple of guys who were there who said, it would be cool to get an internship at that place. And lo and behold, I go to talk to the dean and say, I would love to get an internship. And he goes, it's too late for you. I was in a ju my junior year. And as he said, his phone rang. He picks it up and goes, yeah, I got one right here. And it was a lady named Janet Connor calling from CNN looking for warm bodies. And next thing you know, I have taped my Montgomery Ward stereo to the roof of my car and drove down to Atlanta. And I got started there as a, uh, as a researcher for a show called uh, Crossfire. And uh, I then went from that to running camera uh, in, in studio for a couple of years. And then I went and did what I thought was the coolest job in the world. I, I, I traveled the world setting up satellite dishes um, for, any, for the Gulf War. Uh, anytime President Reagan uh, or President Bush traveled anywhere, um, elections, uh, major events, earthquakes, um, emperor's funerals over in Japan, you name it. I got a chance to set up satellites satellite feeds for those events that had to get covered and brought back to Atlanta to be put on the air on CNN. And um, I got to be pretty good at it. And there was a company here in Washington that wanted to hire me away from CNN. And um, so uh, my boss wouldn't let me out of my contract. He, had, he made me go to the chairman of CNN, Tom Johnson, uh, to ask him to let me out of my contract. And Tom said, if you're looking for something new to do, why don't you find something here? Have you ever thought about going on the air? And <laughs> Believe it or not, um, I had done some voice work at, at, because every now and then when something, uh, something crashed or whatever and there was nobody else around at one or two o'clock in the morning, they would grab me and say, can you say, welcome to Larry King Live? And I'd be like, welcome to Larry King Live. And I used to call home and have my mom just listen to the beginning of the show. <laughs> um, so, but I never really thought about doing anything like going on the air. But uh, Tom Johnson said to me, I've seen you in all the meetings. I know you read all the newspapers because you have to stay on top of the news to, to know where to go to set up all of our feeds and everything. Uh, you, you handled yourself very well, and we, I know you're smart enough to do this. And I turned it down and said no. I turned it down two times. And then one day, uh, my very best friend in life and I were out playing golf, and uh, he said something that changed my life. He said, man, if they think you can do it, why don't you think you can do it? And... Um, you know, it, it really hit me that they were willing, the CNN was willing to put someone who had never been on the air before and transition them from a technical department, that was technically a quasi-engineer, um, and give me a chance to be a represent, to represent the company to the entire world. That kind of took me back a bit. Um, but I made them promise that if I stuck, if I, I said, if I suck, I get my job in satellites back, right? And I had them put that in writing. So I kind of use that as my sort of my safety, my safety net, because uh, I always thought no matter how bad a show I do, I know I still have a job. <laughs> I can go back to being a satellites jockey. And um, uh, it, was, it was interesting. So I made, the, I, I, became, I made his, history in being the only one to make a transition from the satellite desk to the anchor desk. Um, they told me that they would let me, they'd give me three years to figure it out. I would do one-minute one cut-ins on Saturdays and Sundays for a year. Uh, maybe by the second year I could be good enough to be going on overnight, and maybe by the third year I could do the mornings. Well, I, you may recall that one trip that President uh, Bush took where he threw up in the Japanese prime minister's lap. Well, that was my last overseas trip with the satellites department. I set all the feeds up for that and got back and started on February 8th uh, doing the, um, the overnight cuttings on Saturday and Sunday. 
Uh, next thing you know, three weeks later, they had me doing overnights, and then I'm on uh, the night of the L.A. riots breaking out after the Rodney King verdict. Uh, I believe the, the date was April 19th. And uh, I was on throughout the entire night and didn't realize what I was doing. I, I didn't know what I didn't know, and it was that, that's what got me through it. And uh, Dan Rather's agent called the control room and said, uh, who the heck is this kid and where did he come from? And uh, the next week, uh, the, the senior VP of, of, of news, Bob Fernand, brought me into his office and said, I want you on against Brian Gumbel every morning from now on. And so that three-year deal got condensed down to like two and a half months <laughs> from February 8th to May 12th. Um, but the thing is, uh, it, it's, like I said, my story is fluky, but in, the same, in, a, in another sense, it really wasn't because I found out looking back, everything felt like I was doing like this with my life. But I look back at it uh, from this perspective and I can see it was all just like this. Um, when I was in college, um, I, I tried different things. I had a, that scholarship, so I just threw, I felt like I was at, 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 a, at a mall with somebody else's credit card. So I'm, I'm just trying everything. I'm taking, I took so many courses, I almost had a philosophy minor. But what, it, I ended up learning more about the way the stock market works and how uh, how four hundred one k funds and how mortgage rates are figured out by my real estate class that I took in college, and it turns out I learned more than that than I did in my in my econ 101, 102, 103. So when I got a chance to go in front of a camera, it wasn't it wasn't hard for me to figure these things out because I had so many different experiences that I I, I threw in my bag because I didn't know when I might need them, um, and so when I did get a break. I fell back on something else I did in college that I got talked into doing. Um, I had broken my uh, had broken my uh, kneecap and couldn't play ball anymore. And uh, I had a professor who was taking pity on me, and she said, "You know what? You quit moping around. I got something for you to do." And she grabbed me and dragged me to a um, <laughs> a speech club meeting, a, a speech team meeting. And uh, she says, "You're pretty good. I want you to to do this." And I said, "You, you got to be kidding me." You don't get girls on the speech team, you get girls on the football team. So I went back to my door and I told my buddies about that and they all laughed. And uh, one of the guys said another phrase that changed my life. He said, man, you can't do that. Black people don't speech. And again, a light bulb went off and I said, man, that is the most ignorant thing I think I've ever heard. Maybe they haven't done it because I haven't done it. And I gave it a shot, and I never thought it would be something that I would, would enjoy or be good at. But um, the very next year, uh, our team was number four in the nation, and I qualified for nationals three times. And um, so when I got a chance to go in front of a camera, um, I had that in my bag. You know, uh, that's one of the things I tell kids all the time is, you know, try anything that sounds remotely interesting. If an adult you know and trust tells you that you ought to give something a shot, give it a shot. You just never know how much it may pay off for you down the road. So I look back at all those extra classes that I took that had nothing to do with my major in, ra in radio television management. And then I look back at what I learned to do with, with speech and debate and being able to deliver an idea, perhaps even something that someone else wrote. The, the, uh, uh, the discipline I participated in and I competed in uh, was in TERP, solo and duo in TERP. So I learned how to work with another person. We learned how to work with, with uh, you know, scripts from Shakespeare or, uh, or John Steinbeck. And so I could take, I knew what good writing was. Um, I, could, I could tell what a good idea was. I could learn how to communicate a good idea. So when I got sat down in front of a camera um, and everybody said, wow, uh, boy, this kid's a natural. I was like, man, there's nothing natural about this. <laughs> nothing at all. Everything that I, I, I threw in my bag, I have used somehow, some way. Well, that's one of the, one, one of the questions I always get is, um, you know, what is it like to be an anchor? That's a, a logical question. But um, one of the things I didn't fully appreciate before I, I uh, sat down on the, on the anchor desk for the first time uh, was just how much information has got to be juggled, filtered, um, and then delivered through this and then through this. And you got to make it look like nothing's going on. You got to be like a duck or, you know, you're cool up top. <laughs> you're paddling like crazy underneath. Um, there can sometimes be um, 
an absolute fire hose of information. I, I was on the air the day the second plane hit the, the uh, tower uh, on 9-11. And it's an emergency. Um, you don't know what's going on. You, there's so much you don't know. And you're going to have to walk people through it. And you want to do it in a way that's going to reassure people, right? You have all these different things that you've got to, you have got to figure out. It's like doing a long division problem in your head with 12 numbers in it, all in your head with no pencil and paper. Um, and to be able to do that, there's no way I would have been able to do that my first year. But over the years, I, I got, I got to a better handle on how to handle information. Like I can be talking to you right now and have somebody in my ear giving me instructions on what I'm supposed to be doing next or what page is getting, is getting taken out or tossed to this person or do this thing instead. Um, it's that part of it is, is, is the toughest thing to do because you can't, you can't get away with not, with not looking like you're in control all, at all times. Um, and so being able to do that has really helped me uh, in so many other ways in the rest of my uh, other parts of my life, there's, you know, there's always so many other things that are going on. Um, I'm, I'm doing stories about the economy right now, and as I'm doing it, I'm wondering what's going on with my 401k, <laughs> you know? Um, and I, could, I have all these distractions. I have a, I have a mother who's, who's in the hospital. Um, I, have, uh, I have children who have their issues. So I've got so many different balls that I'm trying to keep in the air myself. And I still have got to manage the, all this information that's coming in about about a, about a building that's collapsing, you know, um, or about a plane that just crashed. Um, that part of it is is something I don't think you can you can learn without actually having to do it. Um, and I didn't know what I didn't know when I first got into it. If I had known, I'd have to be able to do all of that when I first stepped off the anchor, the uh, satellite desk, rather. I don't know if I would have continued to 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 follow through on this career path. Um, but I, I have to say, once you get to a point where you've done it for 30 years, um, it becomes second nature. And there's something about it that I love as a, as a you know, as a one-time athlete, is there's nothing like it, man, when, when, when it's like election night or when there's something big going on, maybe an insurrection even. And you've got to, you've got to be on your A game. And you, you're working with one other person sitting next to you, four other, five other people in a studio that you can't see who are doing what they've got to do, and, and they're feeding you information, and they're trying to get video of things, and they're putting things on the screen that you have never seen before. You've got to try to find a way to tap dance around it and, and walk people through what's going on. And then you've got your, your colleagues who are out in the field who are gathering information, and you've got to find a, some way to synthesize all of that into something that somebody at home can digest. And that person could be, that person could be a, a 90-year-old woman or a nine-year-old boy. And you've got to try to find a way to split that atom and get right at what it is they need to know. And I got to tell you, that's like being in the middle of, a, of, of like the best basketball game I've ever played. There's so many things going on and I'm just, I'm just grooving. I just got it. And man, there's nothing like that feeling. It's, it's like being, again, it's like being in a, in a locker room after a football game that you just won. Um, there's nothing like it. If there's, you feel like you're part of a team, and man, I love that. I really love that. And when you do it and you do it well, and you walk away knowing that you left everything out there and you did it, you did it as professional a job as you possibly could, um, there's some real satisfaction. I gotta tell you, there's, there, there were a lot of nights um, when I don't go home feeling good about what we did today. Um, but there were also some nights, man, where I just feel so proud that we, we did what we did and what we did was a real service and we, we crushed it. And we did it with all these things that could have gone wrong, but we made it work. Um, th there's a feeling of accomplishment. There, that's something else I'll tell you. One of the other things that I've, I've come to find is that uh, what I get from this job is something that a lot of people don't get from whatever, works, uh, that, uh, whatever work they do. You get a chance to feel like you, you finished something, you accomplished something every day. You know, if you're working at a, at a, you know, say you're working at a law firm, you have a big case or, uh, that you're working on, you're gonna take, that can take months for you to, to get to a point where you're actually getting, reaching a settlement or getting a verdict or whatever, right? Um, what I do every day, I walk in every single day and it's like, okay, what's the game plan? What are we doing? Here's what, here's what we gotta do. All right, strap up guys, let's do this. 
and you get a chance to, to execute something. Uh, you put together a game plan. You only have a, a couple of hours to put together a game plan that, that millions of people are going to, going to need and are going to be watching and are going to be waiting to find a way to criticize you for. And you've got to find your way to fight that through, through those headwinds right there. And then you do it. And then at 11.35, you say, OK, how'd we do today? That's pretty good. We, did, we had a good day today. We did some good stuff today. And I feel good about that. Um, days like that, I get in the car and go home and uh, just, there's nothing like it. And then there are also the days where, you know, I realized that we just spent the whole week talking about 14-year-olds shooting each other. Um, you know, or, or some people who end up, you know, losing everything they own in, in a fire that was started in, a, in, a, in an apartment building next door to them that, uh, by some people who had, shouldn't have been there in the first place. There were days when we're, there, there were things like that going on that um, it, it doesn't feel as good going home, but you know what you did needed to be done. Um, the sense of satisfaction and completion that you get from doing something like what I do every single day is something that you, I really don't know I can, if I could re replace that with anything else working anyplace else. Well, one thing that we find in, in this business is that it's a small world. It's a very small world. And that's why I, I tell my, my, my kids all the time, treat people right because you just never know when you're gonna see them again. Um, the world is too small. And particularly in this business, uh, we cross paths with each other all the time. I will never forget um, back in, it was mid nineties. I got a, an email. Um, no, it wasn't even an email. Uh, one of the floor directors said uh, at, at CNN said that he had a friend who was at the University of Florida who wanted to be a journalist. And uh, would and she, would I mind looking at her tape? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? I looked at her tape, jotted down some notes, emailed them back to her. She's responded, she was just, just completely overwhelmed that someone on national television would take the time to look at her, her video and, and give her some critiques. And I said to her in reply, um, hey, I'm not doing you a favor. I'm doing me a favor. I may have to work with you one day, so I want to make sure you know what the hell you're doing. Uh, all right, good luck to you. And so 15 years later, 10 years later, um, I left CNN and came to um, WJLA Channel 7 here in town, ABC 7. And uh, they put everybody in the studio together to welcome me to the station. And lo and behold, I look up, and there is that young lady from Florida, Allison Starling. She is now the evening anchor <laughs> over at ABC 7. And she and I went on to anchor together over there for about, I don't know, seven, eight years. Um, and we both laughed our butts off because we thought, how in the world does this happen? And it was like, I told you, you know, this world is too small. The time I took to help you didn't just help you. It helped me. It's, it's going to help everybody here because we're going to be a good team. And I, she's one of my best friends to this day, one of my best friends in life. Um, and that's why, you know, for me, part of, of, of being in a team like ours is understanding that, you know, there's, there's give and take. There's, you know, some of, sometimes there's sacrifice involved by one person. Uh, learning, how, how the, learning how to choreograph uh, who speaks when, um, who gets the big story or who gets the lead, who gets to, who, who gets to go out in the field on, on the assignments. And, you know, I feel like I've been so blessed and so fortunate. There's no way in the world I'm going to take, waste the time of my life to being a jerk about any of that. Um, it just doesn't pay off. It's, it's not going to add one minute to the length of my life. And that approach has really, really served me well. I've got friends like Allison all over the place, all over this town, all over this country uh, because, of, because of that. You treat people right because you just never know. I'll let you know something I don't think I've ever told anybody out in public. Uh, and it's something I did today before coming in. Um, I always say a little prayer. Um, before I go out to, to either do a public event or uh, do a newscast, I always say to ask God to guide my mind, guide my mouth, and guide my heart. Um, and that way I figure whatever happens is supposed to happen. Um, and that gives me, that relaxes me. It's sort of like a meditation that I do um, that really helps me deal with the, with the stress of having to, to, to get into a pressurized situation. Um, I really... 
I, I, I keep going back to uh, that, that, that contract, that my first contract as an anchor, where I had them put in writing that even if I stink, I get my old job back. And that, to me, is, is, is like a relief valve in my head. It's like, no matter what happens, I got a job. I'm, I'm not going to be homeless. I'm not going to be destitute. I still have a wife that loves me. I still have kids that'll, that'll hug me when I come in. My dog, yeah, still loves me. Um, I'm not going to be in a poorhouse. And even if I don't do this here, I can do this anywhere. And what I've learned to do here, I could go anyplace else and find a way to get a job somehow, some way. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll give you an, an example. When my contract came to an end over at the ABC station, um, I had a, a window there that where we, we call it a non-compete, where I'm not allowed to, to work for any other station in town. And I didn't, we were fighting it in, in court, and I didn't realize how soon it would, how long it would take and how soon I'd be able to actually start going back to work. And there were no other station, there were no other openings on any, any other station here in town. So I just said, let me see what else I could do. And so a good friend of mine, recommended that I call up some people who were some, and a couple of them are in the Business Hall of Fame, asked me, so why don't you just call him up and ask him to use his imagination on you for 15 minutes? What could he do with a guy like you? And it just blew me away where I talked to some business people from a, a, across a broad spectrum, a, a, a finance company, uh, one insurance company, a manufacturing company, and each of them had different ideas of, of what I could do for them. I got like three job offers uh, from these different companies that were completely outside of television and outside of broadcasting. And because they saw the skills that I developed in the news uh, and through a newsroom as being valuable to them, being able to help close deals, being able to quickly figure out um, how to work rooms, um, how, how to negotiate. Um, they saw a lot in me that I didn't see myself. So again, I learned that even if this doesn't work out on the air, I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna find another. I'm gonna find something else to do, and and you know, that this is this is this doesn't have to be the last thing or the greatest thing I ever do. There could be more, and that gives me a real sense of, let's just get this done. That gives me a real sense of calm. It's like a meditation. Um, you know, I, I I highly recommend. It's like a mental health time, you know, for yourself, um, and I highly recommend that people find ways to do that. You can't have a job like ours and still have a stomach lining uh, after 10 years if you don't find a way to take some mental health time for yourself and find ways to just de-stress. Um, the, the lifestyles in our, in our newsroom, oh God, bad food, uh, horrible coffee, uh, crazy hours, uh, super high stress, literally from the minute you walk in uh, until the minute your show's over and you get to go get in your car and go home. Um, there are so many stressors that, that just beat you up and down all day long every day. It's, it's, it, that's the reason why there's not many people anymore that can stay in this business for 40 years. Um, and I'm coming up on my, on my 40. Um, but, you know, finding a way to pull that plug and de-stress, that has been the thing that really has helped me out. That and, and playing golf every now and then. Um, you know, finally, what I'd, I'd like to, to leave you with is, uh, again, one of the current, one of the themes that seems to be a, a, a constant current in my, in my life, um, is I highly recommend you never stop trying to find out what else you're good at. You know what you're good at now. Don't know if you're going to need to be good at this five years from now. For you students, the company you end up working for 10 years from now, five years from now, may not even exist yet. You don't necessarily know right now everything you need. And for those of us who are grown and a little bit longer in the tooth, as we're seeing with the pandemic and the way that it's changed our economy um, and it's changed the, our workplaces and all, we may need some more skills or may need to find other ways to make our, our lives more interesting. And the more interesting you make your life, the better life gets. And it gets that way when you always try to Push your brain a little bit. Find out what else you're good at. You just never know what you're going to need or what you're going to enjoy.